put your business hat on first and your HR hat on second. And what I mean by that is always be solving problems in the context of how you can fuel the business engine. And that's our purpose. Hi, I'm Josh Clark, a partner in Hydric and Struggles Boston office and co-leader of our global health tech practice. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Krishma Patel Buford, Chief People Officer at Spring Health. Spring Health provides comprehensive mental health solutions for employers and health plans. Prior to Spring Health, Krishma was the Chief People Officer and Customer Officer at OpFi, a leading fintech platform, and held VP and Director of Talent Management roles at Groupon and BAE Systems. Krishma, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Josh. So excited to be here. Great. Well, let's jump in. You've held HR leadership roles at both large and smaller companies, established market leaders and disruptive innovators, and in multiple industries. How have these differentiated experiences helped you develop as a leader? Thank you so much. Such an important question. And I would add consulting into that experience as well. One of my most pivotal transitions was from consulting to a very large company, BA Systems, 100,000 employees. One of the big lessons that I learned in that transition was how important it is to be practical and pragmatic in the solutions that you recommend to the business. I think as a consultant, you can sell quite a bit of elegant and abstract solutions, but internally you have to live with them and you have to execute on them and make them successful and impactful. And I had some very key moments of feedback in that first experience and transition about how do you make initiatives more business focused and practical. So that was a very important transition that I experienced from consulting to a large company. And then going from large company to startup, a uh, scrappier environment was really about prioritization and the fact that you really have to hone in on trying to do three or five things exceptionally well versus trying to do 10 things okay. And so in my last few experiences in a smaller and startup environment, I've really been pushing my team and the philosophy has been around prioritization and impact in a way that fuels the business versus much of what you sometimes hear in HR is check the box initiatives and rolling mm -hmm. as much as we can. So I think those are my two big lessons in my career through my experiences, pragmatism and prioritization and impact. Any surprises as you reflect back on that, you know, things that translated particularly well or prepared you for these different types of roles that you wouldn't have anticipated would serve you well? Yeah, the biggest surprise is probably through my global experiences. So both BA Systems and Groupon were global experiences and global companies with that footprint. And it was a surprise, but enlightening in the sense that it's certainly not one size fits all. So what could work in the U.S. may or may not work in APAC, in EMEA, in LATAM. And the fact that you have to pivot and try to find what can we do consistently globally and then what do we have to customize locally? And that can change based on whether it's talent management or executive coaching or mental health and what you're doing there. And so you have to be adaptable and you have to be curious and open to what is going to work within a particular culture. And I can't even say my experiences at BA Systems and Groupon, even though I was working in many of the same countries, was the same because the situational context and the timing and the market and the product and services were different. So less of a surprise and more of an enlightenment experience. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's I appreciate you sharing. It would the growing importance for CEOs and boards to have the HR function <laughs> as a strategic partner and given your experience with chief people officer and talent management roles, what are the most important aspects of how you have seen the role evolve? So the answer here to me looks very different than pre-pandemic. And the reason for that is this role, I think, has elevated in an incredible way as a result of the pandemic. I think Previous to the pandemic, the HR function was seen as much more operational, much more of a services function versus that strategic partner. And I think because of the pandemic, the mental health challenges that so many employees experience, the political divisiveness, our social climate, 
DEI and all of those things happening together, remote world, right? The whole remote distribution and workforce was born in this way out of the pandemic. Now, I think CEOs are really seeing the importance of having a strategic partner in a CHRO or a chief people officer. And I think that's the biggest shift. And to me, strategic partnership looks like being a trusted advisor and coach to the CEO and the board, being able to lead enterprise level change. How do you win hearts and minds and obtain massive buy-in for the changes that we're facing internally and externally? Another important criteria and skill set has been around assessing and developing executive talent. So this is where my background and experience in Corn Ferry and, and being a clinical psychologist has really helped me because getting the right talent at the right time is the make or break for many companies. And so I think the strategic partner view has changed as a result of the pandemic. And I think that the skill set that CEOs are looking for is much higher level than it was three or even five years ago. In looking back at this point in your career, what advice would you give your younger self as an aspiring HR leader to prepare for the world we're in today? Yes. I love this question. I think it relates to, to a bit of what we've talked about so far. And, and that is put your business hat on first and your HR hat on second. And what I mean by that is always be solving problems in the context of how you can fuel the business engine. And that's our purpose. That's how you can be seen as a value add versus a cost center. And so what that looks like is working back from the business problems you need to solve. And if those business problems are tied to performance or optimization or attrition or trying to manage supply and demand of talent, work back from what the business problems are that you're solving versus working in your HR vacuum of cut and paste programs or what you think the policy or procedure needs to be. So that's what I would tell my younger self to learn early. That's great. And pivoting here and diving into your experience in the health tech space and the fintech space previously, how do you identify and attract leaders who fit into and can thrive in a rapidly evolving hyper growth environment? Absolutely. And this comes again from my early days at Corn Ferry, where I learned the science of leadership and what really makes the biggest difference. And so I would start with the idea of balancing IQ and EQ. So starting with, of course, the cognitive horsepower and really strong judgment and ability to problem solve in complexity and ambiguity is absolutely critical. It's necessary, but not sufficient. And so where I spent a good bit of my time assessing is on the EQ side. And when I think about EQ, I think about the grit and resilience, so passion and perseverance in a high-speed environment to be able to connect with people, give tough feedback, manage the pressures and stresses of a hyper-growth environment, and be able to make the decisions and get buy-in from people in that environment is especially important. I think that when it comes to enterprise level change, having humility and vulnerability as a leader is becoming much more important in terms of authentic leadership and being able to, again, as I mentioned before, winning the hearts and minds of people, I think is incredibly key. One of our spring health values is actually around breaking barriers. Of course, our mission is to eliminate every barrier for mental health. And so, of course, our leadership competency is around breaking barriers. And so a person's ability to be relentlessly resourceful in breaking those barriers. And that is, again, about the IQ and EQ piece, because it's about identifying what are those most critical problems, breaking through the noise, and then the process is bringing the people along to actually drive change and meaningful outcomes. So those are a few areas that I really dive into when I think about as we assess people. That's great. And of course, identification and attraction is the first part, but then retention comes into play. And so as you think about your approach to talent retention, I'm curious to hear how you navigate through challenging circumstances like the bumpy equity market we're dealing with in the last year. How does that influence your approach to talent retention? 
Absolutely. So the way that we think about retention is, of course, first starting with understanding what are the drivers for engagement and retention at our company, right? So you think about engagement, engagement surveys and data, those are leading indicators for us in terms of future attrition and retention. So we have a wealth of engagement data that tells us what are the most critical factors to retain our talent. And based on just my experience over the last several years, there are a few things that really matter to people when it comes to retaining them. They want to have a sense of purpose and feel inspired by the mission. And I have actually never been at a company that has such a powerful mission and purpose that people live every day and feel. And that we see that clearly and even in our most recent engagement survey. So it's a big reason that people come to Spring Health and stay. So inspiring a sense of purpose is very strong. The other piece is a sense that they can be with their manager in a psychologically safe, inclusive environment where they can unlock their full potential and develop themselves. And so the second area that we are investing very heavily in is building excellent managers, managers who have much of what I've talked about already, who can really support people in driving performance, in helping them achieve their career goals, knowing that there's a path for learning and growth. And the way I think about learning and growth is lattice, not ladder, right? Up is not the only way, but how do you unlock career paths for people? And how do you create an environment where they can have enough autonomy to develop and to innovate and to experience and experiment and also have an opportunity to master a skill that they are feeling really passionate about that will add value to the business. So investing in our managers, I think, as I reflect back on the last 15 years of my career, the biggest lift you can have in retaining talent is to heavily invest in hiring and developing the right leaders. So that is a huge component of our people strategy has been this year and will be moving forward. Great. Expanding on this topic, what should leaders at companies that need to scale quickly be considering as they build out their teams? How can they help determine in general what skills are most needed and the leadership capabilities new executives will need to continue and contribute to growth? The one point I would make on that, Josh, is the idea of what got you here won't get you there. So at different horizons of growth for a company, the skill set that was enough may not be enough in the next horizon of growth. And that's most critical for a company when they go from startup to more of that growth stage to mature. The skill sets are different and what scale looks like is different. And so in that sense, while the foundational skills and competencies may be the same, how long-term and how strategically the leader has scaled is going to be a critical differentiator. Well said. And I'm curious, having transitioned to the healthcare space with Spring Health, do you find the makeup of that organization, the team, the diversity of the functions, the backgrounds and the experiences from technical to commercial to clinical, does that add another layer of complexity compared to other sectors you've worked in in the past? I think that it adds complexity and some tension. So we're for profit in a health space where you have commercial team members and clinical team members. And so I think that there is probably a natural level of tension on the fact that we want to first and foremost change millions and millions of lives. That's why we exist. And the way that we're doing it takes a commercial approach, right? The commercial approach is to be able to partner with customers who have large employee base who we can serve and connect members with care. And that's the clinical side. It's a complexity and a natural tension to continue to navigate. And the reality is we want to do both really well, because by doing both really well and being able to win customers allows us to grow revenue and ultimately profits that we feed back into serving more employees and more people in the world from a clinical standpoint. So there is a flywheel there that is very purposeful, but that's some of the communication and natural tensions to work through in this space. And with the growing focus across the board for employers to support the whole person, how are you internally walking the talk? 
in terms of supporting the mental health and wellness of your own employees? Absolutely. So one of our values is science will win. And so I'm very big on data. And as I mentioned, we use employee data to understand what is it that our team needs. It's not a one size fits all. It's not a take a well-being program from another customer and paste it onto us. That is not our approach. My approach to engagement is very much data driven and customized. And one of the main insights I've had through our most recent employee engagement data is that the place that we are in as a hyper growth company, we have grown faster than most every company in our space. And our rate of growth is so aggressive that most people would experience in three years what we experience in one year. And so hyper growth is true and real for us. And with hyper growth, knowing that our business has grown faster than our infrastructure There's, of course, processes and systems and tools that we need to continue to invest in that reduce friction for our employees that may be causing exhaustion and burnout. And so when you're growing this fast, it's often you're thinking about what's the next big thing? And sometimes the next big thing is doing what you're doing much, much better, more effectively and more efficiently so that people can gain back time. And that's been a big insight of how much we need to invest in that because that actually is impacting well-being and that's impacting burnout. So it's not a traditional wellness program, right? It's actually really honing in on what are the root causes of burnout and exhaustion that I think are organic to our hyper growth environment. The other aspect here, I've been reading a lot about causes of burnout that may seem non-traditional. One other conclusion I've heard based on the research is that in a meeting heavy culture, which is quite frankly, most companies, people are not having time for deep work. So deep work is really when you need to focus your brain on creative ideas and deep analysis and innovation. And so in this meeting heavy plus the Zoom culture that is exhausting in and of itself, people are not having the time to do this deep work. And you can't do that 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there. That is exhausting. It just doesn't work like that. So we implemented what we called Calm Fridays earlier this year for people to do deep work. Now, what is happening? We're getting busier. We're growing faster more meetings. And another realization that I've had is that we need to reignite Calm Fridays around what it means and hold some of that time sacred so that people can do this deep work that they're trying to squeeze in through meetings. And that's a recipe for burnout. So these are just a few of the ways that we're thinking about walking the talk for our employees, but in non-traditional ways. I mean, it's we'll do the resilience training and We're teaching on growth mindset, and that's what I call all the traditional ways. And some of these ideas are the more customized, really data-driven ways that work for where we are as a company. Thanks for sharing those examples. Krishma, you've mentioned to me Spring Internal in the past. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, absolutely. So Spring Internal is our Spring Health platform that we sell and position with customers. And for quite a while, we didn't have our own employees have access to our complete provider network. And so now we have our own employees on our Spring Health platform, plus they have access to all of the providers that our customers have access to. And this was a huge win because when I walked into this role, this was absolutely a pain point that our employees were not having the same experience from a care standpoint that we were affording our customers. And so I'm so proud of my team being able to make Spring Internal work for us. And we started with a target of utilization of 10% for employees to book at least one appointment. And we are now at over 25%. So a quarter of our team is connected to care through Spring Internal. So that's one uh, major way that we are supporting our team when it comes to their own wellness and mental health. That's great. I thought it was interesting to learn that the name of the company, Spring Health, came to be because the founders wanted to be spring every day. The season of spring evokes hope, newness, and change. 
As the chief people officer, how does this purpose attract and engage people? How do you instill that mission internally? That's a great question, Josh. And that's where I've been so amazed at how many people talk about the mission every single day. And it's one of our highest scoring items, again, that people feel such an incredible, not only connection, but they're clearly able to align their goals to our mission on a day-to-day basis. And this is very hard to do. In most companies, I've seen this be a disconnect, right? Especially if you're in a more junior role and the mission feels big and lofty, it's harder to connect to that. And we're in a unique position compared to what I've ever seen where it's very real for people on how we're changing lives and how we're doing that every single day in terms of how many appointments we're booking for every member and converting to patients, we can see it. We can see it every day. And so that's actually one of our core strengths. The other aspect I would say in terms of the meaning of Spring Health is about constant renewal, fresh and and renewal. And and that's another really strong area that we're continuing to build, which is this idea of growth mindset and continue to assess how are we doing and learn and pivot and adapt. So there will be things we will learn that worked that didn't work. And how are we using that to fuel what we do next? So this idea of renewal is also a thread that we've started on. And I think we need to build on much more, but it's core to Spring Health. Great. Our DE&I colleagues here at Hydric recently published an article discussing the prevalence of fatigue in the workplace and its impact specifically on DE&I efforts. Is that something you faced and how are you managing it personally for the company? So specific to my team, the people team and HR and DEI, there is quite a bit of emotional labor and compassion fatigue that comes into play. And on the DEI front, to your question, I learned this the first time when I took over global DEI at Groupon, that it is a very long game. And it is met with barriers and resistance because it's slower. Just think about hiring from a hiring perspective, diverse slates and some of what we want to do. It slows you down to do what is right for the long term of the organization. And when you are a fast growing company, that's challenging. And so you have to try to find the win wins and there's emotional labor there that you're continuing to try to influence. And so much of the role of HR is influencing, influencing through whether it's resistance or gaining commitment versus compliance. And then there's the compassion fatigue that I mentioned. Spring Health just put an article out there around HR leaders and what they're facing. And I think that that's real as well. We are, my team is very much that first line for employees' frustrations and disappointments and things not going as expected. And so a lot of what my team holds true and models and lives by is being compassionate and empathic to employees' needs. And so that's very real. Like what you've heard from your colleagues is a very, very real experience and making sure that as a team, we're taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of our employees better is actually incredibly critical. And so I'm continuously ensuring that my team has a sounding board themselves, right? And has an outlet and an opportunity to make themselves whole and be the best that they can be. And a lot of that is about team support and cohesion and connection and the social support that a team brings. Great. And Krishma, one final question as we begin to bring this conversation to a close. Looking ahead, what specific leadership skill sets and capabilities will be most important as you help Spring Health meet its strategic goals? So I think this touches on a few of the areas that I've mentioned. But if I were to identify two of the most critical, I would say from a leadership perspective, it's the change management, change leadership, and authentic, vulnerable leadership. Those are the two areas that I think are so critical. Change is complex. There are hearts and emotions involved. And so being able to bring people along in a way that's inspiring, exciting, and fulfilling is enormously critical. And it's hard. 
And so what helps fuel that is truly, in my mind, authentic leadership that's transparent and real and honest and unafraid to share the tough messages, give people a clear understanding of the why, and to do it in a vulnerable way. Brene Brown obviously talks about this so much, and I think that talking about vulnerable leadership and then becoming a vulnerable leader are two very different things. The more that we can do that, I think that the trust in employees can increase and surge so much. And so much of my work as I coach the executive team is around building ourselves in these areas, myself included, around how can we do this better. Karishma, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you, Josh. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. 